Hello, my name is Scotty Hamilton, Senior Faculty Member for PM Study and ITIL Study. Nearly every week, all over the world, we prepare students for the PMP and ITIL certification exams. When I teach my classes, I find folks have some challenges with the critical path method. So in this tutorial, I'd like to go over this method to give you a firm understanding of the critical path method or CPM concepts and help you correctly answer questions surrounding this topic on your PMP exam. To start, let's go through a brief overview of the critical path method. This method is located in the Project Management Body of Knowledge, or PMBOK, in the Time Knowledge area, and under the Planning Process group, and is stipulated as a tool in the Develop Schedule process. So what is the likelihood of the critical path method appearing on the PMP? Well, you will definitely see several questions on the critical path method, as well as questions on float and the schedule network diagram. So how are the critical path method and the schedule network diagram applied? The CPM is necessary in building, managing, and executing an accurate and efficient schedule. Let's go over the goals of the video. They are to explain the elements of the schedule network diagram, walk through the forward pass and the backward pass, describe what float is, determine float for each task, and determine the critical path for this project. Okay, let's first review the different elements of our project schedule network diagram. The diagram is made up of five activities or tasks. Task A, Task B, Task C, Task D, and of course Task E. This diagram depicts a finish to start relationship, which means the predecessor activity must finish before the successor activity or task starts. The relationship of these tasks are shown through the arrows. The arrow extending from the end of task A flows to the beginning of task C, depicting A as a predecessor to task C. Let's put the other arrows in now to show the relationships among the tasks. B is a predecessor of C, C is a predecessor to D, and also to E. Lastly, we need to show the duration of each task. Let us assume that A has a duration of two days. For B, I'll put four days, C has six days, D has eight, and E has 10. Let's run through the critical path method to determine the float for each task, the critical path, as well as some other key information about our project schedule activities. The first step in the critical path method is a process called the forward pass. We'll calculate the earliest time a task can begin and the earliest time it can end. After the forward pass, we'll end with the backward pass, which is essentially going from the end of the project back to the beginning to calculate the latest time a task can start and finish without incurring a delay in our project schedule. Okay, are you ready to begin? Here we go. In looking at task A now, when do you think is the earliest time that it can start? Well, I'll give you a hint. Remember task A, as well as task B, both start the project. Okay, since task A starts the project, then it can start the moment execution of the project begins. So we put that as zero. Now the incorrect tendency is to place a one here because it starts on day one. This is incorrect because if you put a one here, you're adding one day of time. Remember task A starts the project, so when it starts, no time has passed yet. Thus no additional time is placed here. Think of it like the start of a race. At the very moment that the starting gun goes off, no duration of the race has passed. So placing a zero to designate the start of a project execution is accurate. The same holds true for task B, as it also starts the project. Now for task A, we need to determine the earliest time the task can finish. To do this, let's add the early start to the duration of the task. Let's take a quick look at task A on our project schedule calendar for a moment. We see that this project begins execution of activities on January 2nd. Since task A begins the project, then the earliest time it can start is Monday morning, let's say 8 a.m. Now we just add the duration time of two days to the start time and we see that task A finishes at the end of the business day on day two. Let's call that 5 p.m. 
Let's do the same for task B and add the early start, which is zero, to the duration, which is four days, to come up with four. Now we determine the earliest time that task C can start. C is dependent on both A and B finishing. Okay, out of these two predecessors, which one finishes last? Well, that's B. So in the forward pass, if there are multiple predecessors to a successor, you take the highest early finish, which in this case is 4. Let's put it another way to make sure we have this concept. I think another look at our schedule on the calendar will help. All right, which of the two predecessors does task C have to wait the longest for to complete before it can begin? You're right, B. We see that A will be done first at the end of day two on Tuesday, and B ends two days after A at about 5 p.m. Thursday. C can't start when A is completed because it is still waiting for task B to finish. Now add the duration of task C, which is six, to the earliest start of four to get the early finish, which I've already indicated here as 10. So now we're up to task D. D is waiting for task C to finish, and so the earliest D can start is day 10. This holds true for E, since it too is waiting on the completion of C, so let's put a 10 in the early start for E. Now it's time for a bit more arithmetic here, so let's combine the early start of D, which is 10, plus the duration of 8 to get 18, and early start plus duration of E, to get 20. The last step in the forward pass is determining the earliest the project can end. Both D and E end the project, so again you pick the higher of the two ending tasks, which in this case is 20 days. Now we will go backwards through the schedule network diagram to determine the latest each task can start and end without increasing the project duration or impacting the successor tasks. We start by putting in the latest time that the two tasks that end the project can complete. Well, since the duration of the project is 20 days, then the latest that task E and D can end is the end of day 20. This makes sense, so let's put 20 here for task D, and we'll also put 20 here for task E. Now we will calculate the latest day that task D can start. To do this, we subtract the duration of the task from the latest finish, or 20 minus 8, which is 12. For task E, we follow the same method and subtract 10 from 20 to get the early start of 10. Now we need to determine the late finish for task C. Since we have multiple successors, D and E, for the predecessor C, we'll need to make a choice. For this situation, simply choose the lower of the multiple late starts, which in this case is of course 10. For the late start for C, subtract the duration of the task, which is 6, from the late finish of 10, to get 4. Let's continue moving backward now through the diagram and look at task A. Since the latest time C can start is on day 4, then the latest time A can finish is also day 4. This same method is used for B, so let's put a 4 here as well. Now, subtract the duration of task A from the late finish, and the same for task B, which is 4 minus 4, or 0. Now that we have finished the forward and the backward pass, let's determine float for each task and locate the critical path. Remember, float is the amount of time a task can be delayed without delaying the project schedule. Also, tasks or activities that have no float are on the critical path. The critical path is the path or paths with the longest duration in your project. If any task on the critical path is delayed, it will delay the completion date of the project. To calculate float for each task, we subtract the early start from the late start, or 
the early finish from the late finish. Either of these two variances will determine the float and will be the same number. Let's pick the late start minus the early start, or 2 minus 0. We now know that task A has two days of float. So let me ask you this, is task A on the critical path? No, because only tasks with zero float are on the critical path. A float of two days means task A can be delayed by up to two days without delaying the project completion date. Let's head to task B now. To calculate the float for task B is either late start minus the early start, or zero minus zero, or you could calculate the late finish minus the early finish, which is four minus four. Again, either of these calculations equals the same number, which of course is zero. So B has zero float. All right, I'm certain you know this one. Is B on the critical path? You're right, it is. Any task with zero float is on the critical path. Let's go through the entire schedule network diagram now and calculate the float for each task. We've already calculated task A, which is two days of float. We've also done B, which is zero days of float. C has zero days as well. D is 12 minus 10, which is two days of float. And E is 10 minus 10, which is zero days of float. So out of the four paths in this diagram, there is one critical path, which is task B to task C to task E. Knowing the critical path will help you focus on the tasks with the greatest impact to your project schedule. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. Thank you for watching, and we hope to see you in our PMP exam prep classes conducted in a city near you. Corporate classes held at your office are also available. Please make sure to like this video and visit our PM Study channel for more informational videos on the PMP exam. Thank you.